Hello, today we're going to talk about um, ethnography. So we're going to leave the social media platforms and now talk about how to, one possible method to study uh, social media platforms. And the reason for doing this is because of the individual exam that is coming up. So by next week I will upload the exam um, as well and you have this lecture. Uh, because one part of the exam will be to conduct an ethnographic study. So you have the information beforehand. And this is because last year students requested to have all this information beforehand. But do uh, note that no questions will be answered on the um, exam or nor this lecture until we meet in class the 13th of October. All right, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about ethnography, uh, since ethnography is based on uh, ethnography. Um, ethnography is very tightly connected to the study of culture. This is what you study when you study uh, when you do an ethnography and also an ethnography. So we have to shortly uh, spend some time on the concept of culture. The course literature, uh, Cosinets, it's very much a um, uh, like a step by step guide to how to conduct an ethnography. So it's very useful in that sense. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then uh, I will just share with you some of my own experiences doing ethnography. And here, not my, the successful experiences, um, but some of the problems that, that I have had. So I think. Problems maybe you will not redo the same mistakes that I have done. All right, so starting with uh, ethnography. So ethnography is an explorative method. Now, what is meant by an explorative method? Well, you often make a distinction between explorative method and um, a hypothesis testing a method. So by, by explorative method you don't have a hypothesis to, to test, you don't have an idea that you want to test, you're more open to the field, what's there. I mean, for example, you don't have, I want to check whether um, YouTube help uh, young people to engage in politics more. That, that would be a hypothesis. Explorative testing method would be like how do you how do young people use YouTube when discussing politics? That would be more of the explorative method. Uh, so the res so the rationale behind an ethnography is to understand rather than to test or to to prove you're right or to test a theory. Important here is also that um, ethnographers. Uh, also tries to study so-called natural situations in the sense that they are not they they do not contact conduct experiments and um, they go out in the reality so to speak and and study what's happening there which to some extent also exclude interviews because interviews is a fabricated situation when you interview someone you take them from their normal practices and ask them about questions you fabricate the data uh, now Interviews are used in ethnography, but if you should be really true to the method, um, you should not uh, conduct interviews because that is not a natural, an interview situation is not a natural situation. It's not the, um, you take your study subject out of their context and ask them questions. You In ethnography, you want to study your subjects, your informants in their context. Um, well, So, um, and this brings us to the roots of ethnography, from ethnography. It comes from anthropology, and as the pictures in the presentation shows, and by the way, this PowerPoint is uploaded to student portals, you have it there. Um, these pictures show how um, ethnography was, is often connected to anthropology, who in t which in turn is connected to um, the conquistadores, if you so wish. I mean, the, the, um, the, exploration of the new world mainly by Europeans and how um, these new exotic worlds were then explored uh, not only by uh, by uh, 
politi politically but also by, by researchers. So um, anthropology means um, the science of mankind and often white anthropologists went to exotic places to study people there. And ethnography comes from this tradition. Um, ethnography literally means, I mean it's Greek, it means uh, ethno means people and graphy to write. So ethnography literally means writings about people. And as such it's, it's both a method as well as the result. I mean you, you conduct an ethnography, you do an ethnographic um, study but while but the result of this ethnographic study is also an ethnography and an ethnography over a people or over a practice and it also has a lot of theories connected to it to it talk about ethnographic theory for example the study of natural situations um, to explore rather than to test etc so there is theory around this as well and we will mention some of the most famous theoreticians here in this lecture. Um, so one of these theoreticians um, that have been theorized about ethnography is Clifford Hertz. Sorry for my Dutch pronunciation. Um, and he's theorized ethnography as, um, as a thick description. Um, and what does he mean by thick description? Well, uh, in order, I mean, rather than to generalize, let's say that you to say that you want to say something about young people in general, you, you seek to understand in depth a few cases. So you, ethnographies are rarely, or some would say that true ethnography is never about generalizations because you cannot generalize. You rather want to study a few or maybe only one. A case very very carefully and very much in depth um, and and there also once again this explorative method so you you do not uh, try to test you don't have any hypothesis beforehand that you want to try to test you're open to the field I mean in this sense is an inductive method you go to the field see what is there and from the, from your experiences and your studies in the field you then uh, conclude, you come to your conclusions and perhaps build the theories. So you do not start from the theory and want to test it. In ethnography you end with a theory and based on observations. So you do not uh, confirm a theory based on observation, you, you come to a theory through your observations. So thick descriptions, so you try uh, to really go in depth, go behind explanations. If I blink like that, what does it mean? Huh? Does it mean that I have Tourette syndrome? Does it mean, or am I flirting with my students? Why am I flirting with my students? Is there something in my childhood that led me to do this? What was it in this childhood? Why, I mean, you always try to ask why, why, why? Go behind every answer. And Clifford Gertz has this, um, analogy of turtles. He says that the world is, is, um, is, is full of turtles that are piled on top of each other. So when you, when you take one turtle and look behind it, huh, why am I blinking with my eye? Oh, he has the childhood syndrome. There is another turtle there, my childhood, that you then have to turn and look behind and what's under there and then you turn, turn, turn because you want to aim at the thick description. Um, you do not satisfy for for um, for the first answer. You want to go behind. You want to understand c carefully. So it's it's a thick description. Early um, early ethnography was very much about exotic cultures, as I said. Uh, famous ethnographers here: uh, Margaret Mead, who studied. Um, uh, the Samoa Islands, Evans Evans Pritchard, who were um, studying the Sunday people in Africa, and Branislav Malinovsky, who was in the Trobian Islands in the Atlantic Sea. So, so the early ethnographers went very far away, often white people going far away to study ex in their eyes exotic culture. 
Um, now this changed in the 50s, 60s with this so-called Chicago School, uh, Irving Goffman, it's perhaps the most famous uh, representative of that, who started to, to um, actually do ethnographies at home. I mean, what is an exotic culture? Exotic cultures can be everywhere, including the home. So, um, you, so he started to send his students out in the streets of Chicago to, to look at what people did there. And there has been ethnographers of, of for example, cruising areas of gay men and, and um, jazz bars with a lot of marijuana smoking people, etc. So, so the idea that you, can, you don't have to go very far away to find uh, something to study started to uh, happen with the Chicago School in the 50s, 60s. And this also, I mean, there was a huge scandal here with Margaret Mead that some of you might have heard of, um, because she did her studies in uh, in Samoa, and um, the coming of age, uh, she particularly interviewed women and their sexual habits, and basically it turned out that she was... Um, she was fooled, they just pulled her leg. So they were telling her stories that were not true, these young women that she interviewed. I think this Gary Larson cartoon is very telling here. Anthropologists, anthropologists, and you see these uh, um, exotic um, natives hiding their uh, TVs and radios, etc. Um, so, so this whole... Um, exotification in the early days of ethnography and anthropology has been widely questioned since then. Um, one of the main, well, one main controversy within ethnography is the, I mean the so-called, I mean which has to deal with this exotification, um, whether you have to uh, go to a culture that is alien to you in order to, to, to study it. Um, the idea that you have to be an outsider to really see what's going on in a culture. Um, or can you understand something if you're not part of the culture? I mean, I know when I was a kid in the 90s here in Sweden, there was um, a lot of controversies um, in feminism, for example, excluding men because men could not understand what it was to be a a, a woman. Um, so so the, and this goes and we had these fairs, women can and men were excluded. So this this whole idea that on the one hand, if you're part of the culture, you're so blinded by it that you cannot understand or study it objectively um, or neutrally. I mean, this was the time when people still believed in objectivity and neutrally. On the other hand, if you're not part of the culture, will, will you be able to understand it? Can you as a man understand how it is as a woman? Now, I mean, this question came up mainly because of the feminists who were, when they were conducted, conducting ethnographies, they come to vastly different results than when men conducted ethnographies in the same area. So in this sense, people started, ethnographers started to look at themselves and what, what do I bring in to this situation? That I'm a woman, does that um, influence how people meet me and what kind of information I can get here? Uh, and can you indeed be neutral in the field? Can you be objective? And then, of course, the whole um, discussion of going native and being native. Um, the, the, I mean, there are examples of ethnographers being so immersed in the culture that they went native, they became part of the group. Um, and some me, people mean that you, you have to be native from the beginning. So this is a discussion that is ongoing based on the issue whether you, it's possible to understand a culture you do not belong to. Um, on the contrary, then, is it possible to see interesting phenomena in a culture you belong to yourself? I mean, when I did my, my doctoral thesis, I studied the municipality of Helsingborg, basically a, a municipal organization. Now, in the sense, it was alien to me because I've never worked politically or didn't know any... Uh, civil servants, etc. 
but the, the setting as such and um, this um, in South Sweden was very familiar to me as this is where I'm born and raised um, but what you could do and this I will return to this when we look at the particular method is what I call the alien method because sometimes when I was studying municipal meetings with citizens um, I used the so-called um, um, alien methods because when I sat there after like the 10th meeting I've been observing um, as an ethnographer doing an ethnography and I didn't see anything nothing interesting was happening I didn't see anything there then I just tried to imagine what if I were an alien and I was just beamed down from the spaceship into this municipal meeting with citizens what would I see what would be so this is a method you can use in order to alienate yourself a little bit from the cult if you're doing ethnography in the culture that you understand which most of you I guess will do and all of a sudden you can start to see things I mean what is this Swedish obsession with fika with coffee and cake what does this say about the culture um, how was the the, the, the coffee trade um, the coffee um, placed in the in the uh, room what does this say about the culture etc so this can be a method to use if you get stuck especially if you study a culture you belong to yourself now important in ethnography and I mean is to to try to understand it from the participants themselves it's very important for ethnographers not to have this von Oben um, attitude, this attitude from above that I'm gonna come here and explain things to you. Um, this is for example like <laughs> development uh, researchers in Africa, we're gonna tell you how to do things in Africa because we come from the West and we are the best. Um, in ethnography you are obliged to try to understand it from the participants. Um, from the members of the culture without patronizing them um, but um, at the same time it can be necessary to distance or be yourself from the culture in order to analyze it systematically uh, one way could be the alien method as I said so as always the truth is is in between here that it's good to know the culture you study but you sh and you should try to s understand it, study uh, it from the v perspective of its participants. Uh, while at the same time, same time, sometimes it can be good to distance yourself a little bit in order to study it systematically. All right, so that was the very short introduction to um, ethnography. Now let's delve into the concept of culture because this is very tightly connected to ethnography. So ethnography is about culture. It is the study of culture. Now, culture in the understanding, in the anthropological understanding of the world as a way of life and how we attach meaning to our life, not in the sense of the refinement of the sentence as, I mean, as for example you have if you read the daily they have the culture section I mean the culture section doesn't deal with with how we attach meaning to the way of life it has to do more with theater movies uh, books etc the refinement of the sentence uh, of the senses but we mean here um, culture as a way of life and how we attach meanings to this way of life and I'm leaning towards Schertz here again. Um, so culture can be understood as a set of values, beliefs, knowledge that inform, guide and motivate our, our behavior. Um, and this is what ethnographers often are very interested in, this culture. What is, how are people living their life and how do they make their life meaningful? How do they attach meanings to this? What values, beliefs, knowledge is important here? Um, so ethnographers focus on life as lived and all the mess of factors that comes into that. I mean, remember you thick description, you turn in turtles all the time. So you're aiming for a holistic, thick, uh, in-depth understanding rather than a general, general understanding. 
So culture here um, understood as a realm of meaning, engaging and interacting actors, interacting actors. So um, this society or culture that we study is filled with these actors, people, or even if you want to take an actor, ne actor network perspective, ANT perspective, you can also look at technological artifacts as actors. So you have these actors that are um, populating um, the culture that you are, you are studying and you think of them as meaning engaging. They engage in meaning making and produce meaning and this is what you are interested in as an ethnographer. Um, and this is what you want to study. Um, and I think um, Gertz again has a very good method for about culture. He says that we uh, humans are uh, trapped in the, the mid midst of a web of meaning that we ourselves have spun and the web of, um, the web is this culture so we we create this idea that what we do is meaningful um, and this becomes then the culture um, um, and you can also say if you want to take this metaphor even further that uh, media can be seen as a spinning wheel here helping us to spin this web of meaning i mean for example why are you watching this video lecture right now. I mean, why? Because you think it's meaningful, it's important for some sense. I mean, but, but you could. I mean, if you were an alien teleported down here on Earth and seeing all these students watching the same lecture um, about me talking about some kind of methods, they would think this perhaps is crazy. Why don't they just go out in the sunshine that is at least here right now and lie in the sun? Um, because you have made it meaningful, because you attach meanings to this, this might lead to a job uh, and you want to be rich or I mean whatever and you keep turning turtles. So, so this is what, what is important here, um, meaning. And technology, not only are they these spinning wheels of the web of meanings that we spin around us, but they can also be meaningful objects um, and I mean, we can attach meanings to, to technolo te technological ob objects um, and or, or its functions. Huh? Um, Nancy Bame says here that people assign and generate meanings to technologies through reflective communication. So we, we attach meaning to this. So social media platforms can be practices on social media are meaningful to groups, peoples, in culture. How? What? What kind of meanings? How do people attach meaning? What kind of meanings? And the technological artifacts themselves can have meanings. I mean, just look at the iPhone. Maybe the iPhone is losing its um, losing its aura of um, of uh, as a symbol uh, lately. But just go a few years back and it was the status symbol um, and the the apple laptop with the shiny white apple um, that signal something uh, that we were cool design oriented there has been ethnographers talking about the tribe i'm uh, using anthropological language the tribe of apple users clearly identifiable by the white earphones hanging down from them. So we attach meanings to this. It means something to use an iPhone and all the Samsung effects, etc. Um, and, and as we know today in digital, late modernity in, in our digitalized societies, um, digital technologies have moved from being fringe objects to being deeply embedded in our everyday life and identity. It's becoming ubiquitous in our life it's, and as such is very important for our identity. And um, two colleagues of mine, Andre Jansson and uh, Magnus Andersson, has talked about this as reflexive culturalization, meaning the increasing investing or investment of symbolic meanings to things and practices. And, and my argument here is that these things and practices that people are be increasingly becoming reflex, culturalized reflexively, 
is social media practices and digital objects. So um, in this sense, social media platforms are not um, neutral technologies and not, I mean, yeah, we know that they are not neutral technologies from reading books, but also they are not neutral in the sense that we as meaning and uh, engaging uh, actors attach meaning to these objects. And this is what's interesting. So practices on social media are constructed and main, made meaningful through a range of complex processes, which then is the job of an ethnographer to find out. Um, the internet and social media practices are always local inventions by its users. And this is also important to, to underline here that once again, this is not about talking about um, the meaning attachment to social media practices in general. or oh, young people on Facebook use it like this. No. The use of Facebook or the internet is always an, an invention. We invent it every time we use it. So as an ethnographer, you can only um, say something about a very small segment of, of the user. And you remember, you're going to do something in-depth rather than generalize. So there is always the dialectic within the social and the material. We talked about that. Um, so in this sense, technology is not just its materiality, the thing that we can hold in our hand. It's um, a cultural inflected genre of usage in a fancy term. Okay, ethnography. So ethnography. I mean, you have the course book um, by Cosi Nets here. You can say that ethnography is um, ethnography's, ethnography's virtual sibling, adapted to the characteristics of social worlds online. And ethnography focused exclusively on net-based social environments or networked sociality. Um, so we so it's basically based on observations or um, cultures that or take place online. Uh, so the internet is understood as a social cultural space and the aim is to understand the social interactions and the meaning making practices taking place online of a particular group, network or practice. Huh? So it's based online and the idea that there are many cultures online that you can study today. And there are a lot of advantages here. As a, as a researcher, you can free yourself from the physical space and conduct observations in a virtual context. You can do, basically you can sit at home with your computers and conduct an ethnography. Because you're looking at the user generating flows of information here. You can follow a chat, you can follow a community, you can follow study dating sites, etc. As I have done um, from the comfort of your home. So you, you do participant observation, huh? that you participate in the practice, but you can do that from your home. You don't have to go to the Trobian Islands in the midst of the Atlantic Sea to conduct an ethnography. So it's fieldwork online, but you're still searching, looking for, for um, embedded deep cultural understanding. You're tr still trying to understand the practices from the participants on themselves in on the online culture that you study. So we always try to understand the practice or the culture from the perspective of the participants and the users, as stated before. Yes. There are, of course, um, other differences concerned compared to offline ethnography. Anonymity. You can be anonymous and people are anonymous to a large, much larger extent than, than offline. Um, it's easier to access communities, as I said. Um, there are also this whole archiving, archiving materials online that you can access. Um, you can go back in history to see how groups have interacted, etc. And there are ethical issues that are very different as well. We'll get into some of them later in the lecture. You can look at asynchronous as well as synchronous postings. So you can both go back in time as well as study things that happens uh, in real time. So, but this because of the archiving. 
practices on social media online, you have the possibility to actually study things that happened earlier um, before you came there, which is different from offline uh, ethnography. Cosinets are, are lining up many differences here. Um, that communication is changed online, maybe because of anonymity. Well, maybe perhaps not so more, but this was at least during the time of the book something he wrote about. Access, it's easier to, to um, access communities online. As we said, archiving, you can find interactions and study interactions in Hinsight. Um, analysis, um, there is differences on also how you can anal analyze this mass of data. Um, and when it comes to the ethical consideration, we'll talk a little bit about that later. I mainly concern what's public or not. I mean, as researchers, we are only allowed to study public information. And can you consider a, a group online as public or not? And then he also talks about the capital that these social media are uh, capitalist companies, um, and we should be aware of that. But we are having followed this course, course so far and reading books. We are well aware of that. No worries, Mr. Cosinets. So the physical absence online is compensated by a range of different textual and figurative representations, which is interesting because this because we choose how to portray ourselves online to a much larger extent than offline. Actually makes the online environment very good for, for uh, study identity negotiation or practices of positioning because we are more reflective of how we portray ourselves and what we say online than we would perhaps do online. This is at least what um, Cosinets argues. Um, but I mean, I do agree that identity negotiation status in a group very um, well, easy, but it's it's more accessible to study this online than offline. Identity negotiation in particular. And data can consist, I mean, the empirical data that you gather can be archival data or elicited data. Well, this is where, <laughs> you know, a, a true ethnographer would say that elicited data is not, um, is not, um, real ethnography, but by participant observation uh, you will uh, participate on the site and get data and that you will use. Uh, interview, you can also conduct interviews as uh, a caveat here that some would say that it's not real ethnography. And then uh, reflective data, I mean you yourself is part of the data gathering that you reflect upon your um, Mm. on your experiences participating in this culture, uh, how you understand and how you make meaning, so yourself becomes uh, part of the um, data gathering, reflective data. Um, yeah, since we live in hybrid communities and societies, um, net ethnography works very well in combination with, with mm. offline ethnography. Um, as well as other methods. I mean, often when we conduct large studies, we, we use a plethora of methods, but uh, ethnography, ethnography, interviews, um, it's very good uh, to combine. Um, yeah, even quantitative data, even though it's important to remember that as an ethnographer, you never aim to generalize, you aim to understand in depth um, but not to generalize. Mm. So to think about then is to gain access to a field, to enter into a field, um, a group or a culture that you aim to study. What will be your identity there? How will you interact with people? Um, it's always a good combination to observe, listen and ask, to do many different things. What people tell you will be different from what they do. Um, and also think about taking field notes. Online this is easy. Mm? You just 
conduct your field notes as you are observing. But I mean, when I did my studies of the municipal deliberations for my doctoral thesis, um, I often had to run into the bathroom and take notes because you don't want to take notes in front of people um, because then they become acutely aware that they are observed. Okay, so let's look at the book by Mr. Cosinets. Well, we have talked about it a little bit. Let's look at it uh, more. And especially from chapter five in the redefined second version here, it becomes like a handbook in, in doing ethnography. So as, in this sense, it's very helpful for you, I think. Um, very like step by step how to conduct an ethnography. So this can be very, very useful for you. Uh, and he talks about this as 12 phases. Um, you start with introspection. You start with yourself. It always starts with yourself. What are your motivations? It's, um, think about going native, being native. Maybe you're going to choose a group or a culture that is close to you, that you already have access to. Of course, then there come some ethical questions here. Are your friends aware that you do research on them, etc. So you start with yourself. Um, and then investigations. I mean, how um, the case that you study, um, the group that you study has to fit um, what you aim to do. I mean, if you want to study young people in general, for example, do not just focus on, on, on students. Now, that was a bad example because you're not going to generalize, but um, mm, okay, very crude example, if you want to study um, um, feminist, feminist concepts, maybe you should not focus on, on online worlds that are mainly populated by men, for example. Ethical concerns, um, are: is this public, is this not, is it not public? Uh, information data that you or, or groups that you participate in are is the are these people underage are they in particular are they a, a um, minority groups are these a sexual minority that might face prosecution if data about them comes out so you have to think about ethics maybe you should start with an interview with the niche um, with users in order to find your way navigate yourself into the field um, I mean, a, a, an online group can have a plethora of different um, um, practices online. I mean, for example, when I did my study of an online dating site, I particularly focused on one forum because I was interested in politics, political participation. So, so you know, maybe because you don't want to be overwhelmed in data. So find the, and you want to go in depth. Remember the in depth focus here. Um, so, um, inspection interaction and then you start with your interaction so you, you do not just anonymously observe you you participate yourself in order to get an, a deep understanding from the perspective of users it's deemed very important that you do conduct participant observation not just observation participant you participate yourself and then you immerse in the data, you try to index it, catalog it, um, and then the very tricky question. You don't want to have too much because then you drown in your data. Believe me, I have examples of that when I had like 2,000 pages of observation data. It was too much. I, was, I couldn't find anything because it was too much. But you don't want to have too little either. Um, and then it starts the process of interpreting the data. So you have, uh, and, and this is it's good, this happens, it's important that you don't, that this happened a little bit simultaneously, that you can go back and forth between your field observations, the text when you write the text and the theories that you use, you can go back and test and try yeah, as you turn the turtles. I mean, the theories you use will be helpful for you when turning the turtles, in order to get this thick description and deep understanding. So it's, it's, it's good that you can go do this a little bit simultaneously. Find the good examples. You cannot account for everything when you write ethnography. Um, save the good examples that exemplifies what you want to say. And then you have to integrate this into a story, a coherent tale, an ethnography. 
yes, and yeah, you, finding your focus, I think there's very good examples of that in the book, as well as how to formulate research questions. So have a look at that. Ethics. What are you allowed to do? Is this public or is it private? A good, is it password protected? Is a good starting point. Um, this is important to find. Are there any underage people there? If there are any people, don't. Don't do research there. Well, I'm not in this stage because you will not have the time to get consent from people. And by underage, I mean under 18. Are people aware that they are research? Are you open with this? Now, you could, of course, influence people um, by by saying that you're a researcher, but you're not allowed to wall wrap. You have to be open. You have to be open with your claims. You cannot fool people here. Um, one way of, of giving back to the community is actually to share your results with them. Um, are there any hierarchies here in the group? Um, it could be good to get consent and to, to talk and reveal who you are, to, uh, moderators, owner. When I studied uh, forum discussions, um, I, I had the consent by the forum thread starters to use it. I didn't have to go and ask for consent by everyone who participated in the thread. It was enough with the forum thread starter. Um, also look at the terms of use. Um, in the when I started Cruiser dating site, um, I couldn't get hold of the um, publisher. He didn't answer my emails, but I looked at the terms of use. Did I violate any terms of use by conducting research there? No, I didn't. So maybe it was okay. And I had the consent by the forum thread starters, so it was okay. Um, are you revealing any personal information in the studies? Maybe it's important that you anonymize your informants or the people you study when you write your ethnography. Um, one, I mean, if they indeed are acting as if they were anonymous. So, so you'll have to think about this as well. Also, this is tricky one. Make sure your data is stored at and so not anyone can access it. Well, I mean, with NSA and surveillance, so we know that it's almost impossible to store data in a safe way, but at least make it hard for other people to access your data. And when I did my offline ethnography in, in Helsingborg in the municipality, I had it locked into a locker of my interview excerpts, etc. Are there any harms? Are there any minorities, uh, groups that are facing persecution? You have to be extra careful with this group. Uh, and then, I mean, is, if your research is valuable, important and interesting, and you can argue for that, it's always easier to argue for your ethical claims. When it, <clears throat> when it comes to analysis techniques, Cosinets um, highlights a few of them, perhaps some better than others. Um, I think with analysis is about testing theories. I mean, starting with the with the observation, of course, this is an inductive method. Then going to theories, having ideas, testing these ideas, going back and forth. I, I think about analysis as as making out, and hopefully you all know how to make out. You have to be at least two persons. Um, and you start to kiss. So and instead of having two person kissing, think about empirical data as one and then uh, the second as your uh, theories or your concepts and then you have to make them snuggle you have to, to make the data st stick in her tongue into the mouth of the theory etc in order to get this analysis um, <clears throat> okay so one way of analysis is by imagination I think about the alien test um, um, imagine that you're someone else, imagine something, huh? imagine what if you were like this and came into this culture, what would you see then? Um, <clears throat> another thing could be to re-memorying, oh, that's a difficult word in English, <clears throat> I mean when you've spent some time in this community or culture, just move away, take away all your data, everything, and just what is the first thing that comes into your mind about this? What is that struck you? Maybe this is the important thing huh? that you need to focus on here. <clears throat> Abduction. 
try to fit things together, rub your concepts and data against each other, you know, making them out, as I said. Uh, what sparks? What baby comes out of this? Which, which is the best explanations, etc. Um, visual abstractions. Um, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's like with remembering, but vis visualizing what is the larger universe in general criteria you can sense in your material. Um, I mean, I, if you look at the page, for example, you can do the, how do you say, when you, you do not really look, you kind of close your eyes. What does pop out here in this green now when I look at this? Of course, the red dot here pops out. This is the, so maybe this is the important thing. So you can use different visualization techniques to, to get to the interesting stuff on the website. Um, artifying. Um, search for corresponding method for, for your data. Maybe you can find other ways to think about your data. I think when you're immersed in this project, always have like a dictaphone or a notebook with you because often when you walk or do something else, swim, I was in the swimming pool when I wrote my PhD thesis, this is when I got the ideas, when when I kind of relaxed my brain and did not focus so much on, on the data, this is when the connections were made and all of a sudden in the swimming pool I, I, I had this very smart idea and then I had to take it down very quickly before it lost oh, I have to run up and, and I, I recorded in my phone ideas that I had um, cultural decoding meanings oh, it's always important in in um, ethnography and then Cosinets also talks about what he labels tournament play it's also a form of abduction I would say make your analytical ideas compete and let let the best one win well I mean yeah, we can have a talk about this in class. Some of these techniques, I think, are better than others. Okay, so let's finalize this short lecture um, by telling you about some problems that I had. Um, and one is about the public. Um, so normally you say in um, ethnography that, is it the site public? In other words, is it password protected or not? Uh, do you have to become a member before you can start studying it? So I studied this uh, queer dating community, studied political discussions there. And uh, this was, as you can see here, password protected. You had to become a member to log in there. On the other hand, you see here, they actually display with pictures, mind me, uh, of um, uh, users already on the login page here that you didn't have to become a member to see the login page um, so i use this as an argument for why um, this was not that anonymous and i also used the argument that i didn't violate any terms of use i also used the argument that i had the consent of all thread starters in the threads that i studied etc so there are different ways to argue here to have a look at um, these things and the other experience which is perhaps more tricky and comes from the same data when I studied political discussions on this um, uh, gay dating site is that I mean you are in a sense trying to get a deep understanding here an embedded cultural understanding see things from the participants you have to make an effort to understand the participant. Now, the political discussions on this dating site was very conflictual, very rude. Um, and, and I didn't, I mean, I didn't like the participant. I am disliking them. And how are you going to, to get to a deep um, understanding of um, people if you don't like them. Um, this was particularly tricky for me. So the, there was a lot of trolling, um, a lot of flaming, a lot of name dropping. Um, so, so it was very hurtful for me and I was called all different kinds of stuff in this community. Um, and, but then I became a little bit like pissed off. I started to feel like, oh, I'm gonna get you. You always call me names when I post something in this forum. 
Um, so I started to to give back in the sense, and all of a sudden, it was starting to become a little bit more fun to participate in the forum when I started to see this. Oh, I'm gonna get you, and here you have your faggot, huh? and because this is how people talk to each other there, and that they're idiot faggots, um, transvestites, perverted people. So. And then, I mean, I, by doing this, by actually engaging this, I gain some understanding of the trolling and flaming behavior. And I understood also by doing this that that what was actually going on here, people were having fun. They were not discussing politics. They were passing their time and having fun. And by having fun, teasing each other. And then I also saw that by being teased, and being picked at and being attacked was actually a sign of acceptance. That you were part of the game, that you were a player of this game. Uh, a much better faith than, for example, being ignored. Which I then also confirmed with, in some interview results with the data. So, so, but of course, it, before I, before I, I, I um, accepted the lower sides of my personality and went for them and became rude and trolling and flaming myself, I didn't get any, any kind of deep understanding of what was going on here. So, so this is important. And of course, here so it was also important for me to, to think about my when I went back to my reflective diary, uh, when I reflected uh, upon my experiences while I was doing this, conducting this ethnographic, and then when I described the um, how I felt <laughs> Um, the the satisfaction that I felt attacking those who had attacked me. So by by this this also shows the importance of the reflective diary here, uh, that you're also true when you refle reflect about your experiences in the field. Because this was not th this was not a pretty picture of me, that I rejoiced in being rude to other people and attack other people. But by seeing this in my reflective diary, I also got a deeper understanding of the trolling and the flaming that took place there. So it's important to be true. And it's also important to, to recognize perhaps the darker sides of yourself. Mm. Okay, thank you for listening. And uh, do note that the um, exam will be uploaded next week. Um, late next week, middle next week, by Thursday the latest. Um, and if there are any questions about doing an ethnography and any questions about the exam, um, that will be answered the 13th of October, not before that, because exam period starts 13th of October. Okay, take care. Bye.